Awesome. We'll get started. So, uh, first of all, a warm welcome to all the participants of phase two, that is ideation phase of the India Smart Protein Innovation Challenge. As you know, the Inspiration Webinar Series is an initiative to educate about 500 young students, researchers, and entrepreneurs who are part of that challenge. Uh, you know, from multiple universities across India, a lot of startup founders, a lot of people working in the food industry, and they're all basically currently evalu evaluating ideas and, you know, trying to ideate better, strategize better about their product solutions and their business proposals uh, for the phase two submissions, which are due 25th of September. And the five category areas are plant-based meat, plant-based dairy, plant-based seafood, uh, plant-based eggs, and, you know, pl powering plant-based solutions. So I'm, I'm hoping that you are all excited for this webinar. This is webinar number seven. And the topic is uh, plant-based raw material optimization for the smart protein sector. Uh, a lot of you have seen this presentation, but uh, have not heard Siddharth, who's a science and technology specialist and also a guest speaker for today. Uh, he leads the science and technology initiatives at GFI India, specifically focusing on the plant-based side of things. And he has had a lot of experience in the food science domain. He was a food science and technologist. Uh, he, he did his bachelor's from Uswania University and then went on to uh, the Rutgers University in the US where he studied food science and cutting edge research areas like cold atmospheric plasma processing. Uh, I met Siddharth back at Institute of Food Technologists in Chicago, you know, a few years ago and I was fascinated with his work experience. Uh, he worked, his work with Nestle, his work with General Mills and also spent three years at Just, you know, uh, having a pivotal contribution to the Just Egg. And now he's using all of his knowledge and insights from the food processing sector, from the food science research domain, scaling up things, processes, and all, all of that knowledge he's applying to create the smart protein sector and accelerate it in India. So we are very, really glad to have Siddharth on our team. And I'm really happy that he's taken time out today to speak with all of you. And more importantly, answer a lot of questions that you might have now from a science and technology perspective about your proposals. So let's get started with today's session. Welcome Siddharth. Uh, I, I now uh, kind of welcome you to start with your deck. Thank you, Shadul, uh, you know, for, the, for the wonderful and warm introduction. I'm very happy to be here too. Uh, you, know, you know, teaching, I, I was a teaching assistant part-time TA back at Rutgers too. And you know, it was a very satisfying sort of experience. I'm, I'm happy here to share my knowledge, uh, you know, on plant proteins per se, how to make plant proteins, how do you make uh, plant-based products, you know, be it meat, eggs, or dairy. And uh, yeah, happy to give this lecture today. I also have another session tomorrow where I'll be talking more on the end product side of things. Like once you have all your ingredients, how do you process them? How do you texturize them to make your final products? Uh, Shardul, are you able to see my screen properly? Yes, no issues? yes, okay. absolutely. And I, I cannot see the chat. So if there are any pressing questions uh, as, you know, we walk through the presentation, please do let me know. And yeah, and today about... I'll encourage people to ask questions as and uh, when they come, you know, occurring to the specific topic or the specific slide, just put it in the Q&A button. We'll make sure that we go from a, you know, timestamp or on a basis of most upvoted questions so that all of them get covered. And we'll be very rapid in our Q&A. So make sure that you add a lot of context where you're coming from, maybe describe a little bit about your idea or the ways you're, that you're thinking about uh, before asking that question so that it's easy for us to answer. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So today's lecture is more on raw material optimization uh, in that what we are going to be walking through is just a little revision of, you know, the last session where, you know, I'll again be going through the definition of plant-based meat, uh, you know, kind of just some examples on deconstruction, etc. And then we'll be deep diving into the raw materials and more specifically on proteins because proteins form the key component of uh, any plant-based uh, alternative protein product. And they are the ones which provide structure to your product while also uh, providing functionality to your product. So we'll be essentially walking through the entire value chain from seed to protein isolates and different processes that are involved in making protein isolates. We'll also be talking a little bit about fat, binders, flavorings, and colorants. And that's, that's what we'll be covering in today's presentation. And in the next session, as I said, we'll be uh, talking about how do you mix all of them together to get the right product that you have. So quickly, uh, going through you know, uh, the definition what we walked through in last session, plant-based meat as a product that closely resembles an animal-based product in its textural and flavor properties. And you, know, you guys must be knowing this now, you know, the impossible burger or the beyond burger or the just egg, egg just eggs is on the egg side. And you know, all of these are replicating their animal-based counterparts exactly in their textural and flavor properties. And that's what we mean by plant-based meat or you know, plant-based products. We are not talking about the version 1.0, which were more around like soya chaps or soy nuggets, et cetera. 
again we always talk about uh, you know plant based uh, any product production here i have you know taken the example of meat but you could also apply to eggs you could also apply it to dairy based products so first you select your crop and then you can use your crop as is or you need to optimize it to get a better functionality a better nutritional profile etc post that you need to actually get this protein isolates out from your crop which is a you know a big process in itself and i believe that is the the fifth part of the smart protein innovation challenge that how do you create functional ingredients protein is definitely the key ingredient which we are going to focus on but in addition to that fats also play a very big role your additional ingredients like starches binders uh, colors flavors also add to the product so and you know there are a lot of companies you know which exclusively focus focus just on color making <laughs> or exclusively focus just on flavor making so all of these are very important components in your final food product creation excuse me and the third part is the end product optimization where you kind of blend all these together so the impossible burger again lot of ingredients out there on the screen but then all of them have a specific function and as we spoke uh, discussed last time there are three types of protein which have been blended together to form these low moisture extrudes what you see on the screen at the bottom and then literally everything else right from binders to fats to flavorings vitamins minerals preservatives colorants have been blended together to form the slurry what you see and then you know the patties are formed and then you know they are cooked and that's how you get your patty and today what we are really going to focus on is how do you get the soy protein concentrate how do you get the soy protein isolate and how do you get the potato protein uh and functional components of it so if you go to the market and if you kind of blend just you know soy protein concentrates what you find or soy protein isolates that you find even after you blend it and texturize it using low moisture extrusion the final product what you get you may not get the right textural properties what you see in an animal product so uh, pretty sure you know these suppliers uh, you know with supply these protein isolates and concentrates have decades of experience uh, you know like working in uh identifying the right processes the right processing parameters to get the most functional concentrates or isolates out there and today we'll be walking through few of those processes same thing with beyond again a total of 18 ingredients uh but then these are different so what beyond has done is that it has used the same technology of low moisture extrusion but then instead of using a blend of soy and potato it used a blend of pea rice and mung bean and again the same thing right if you go out there in the market and buy a mung bean concentrate it may not function as well in your low moisture extrudate product so you know there are processes that you need to follow to functionalize these proteins okay so in terms of raw materials and plant based meat as you saw the classification was there was protein and protein usually was in the form of concentrates isolates or hydrolysates sometimes then you have your fats binders colorants flavorants and other ingredients for any functionality uh focusing on proteins now uh some plant based uh, protein sources that you have seen so far uh typically legumes and pulses are used because they are already high in protein and it just works well with the economics of the product but in addition to that you know grains are also used sometimes you have wheat rice and quinoa especially because and especially in asian countries you know because wheat and rice is already used so much more for its carbohydrates that you know a lot of times protein is a waste stream and then people are finding innovative ways to actually functionalize uh the proteins what you get from wheat and rice so that you know the cost economics of the product again becomes better and that is something you can think about too you know uh you might be tempted to go with soy rice chickpea that's great but at the same time you could see if you know maybe you can add in a functional component uh to the product using a wheat protein or a functional component using a rice protein seeds are also used sometimes uh see sunflower proteins hemp proteins flaxseed proteins for their functionalities that they might provide and again these are not very uh, well researched out there that's why you'll see that typically all the companies use a blend of soy pea chickpeas and maybe they do use some other proteins but they are in very minute quantities because they are still figuring it out uh, the production has not scaled up to the commercial levels that are needed by these companies etc so again a research area which you can think about while giving your proposal and then as we saw potato protein for its functionality and here is kind of just justifying what i j- mentioned so if you look at peas chick peas lupins etc right or soybeans they are typically high in their protein content so because of which what happens is you know if i have a crop right and i need uh, to isolate the protein from it if i just start off with a crop which has high amount of protein and less amount of carbs or fats or etc it's just a relatively easier process like i don't need to pass it through multiple centrifugation steps or any other multiple you know like defatting steps etc uh and it, it's just easier plus it also works with the economics of the product whereas with others there might be a few repetitive steps which we'll be talking about in the coming slides 
uh, soybean is still like the predominant protein source which is used in a lot of plant based products uh, because it has a high protein content about 35 to 40% plus just is this better now chadal yeah okay perfect so soybean because again you know there has there have been like decades of work uh, that has been done on soybeans and essentially uh, soybean was optimized most for its oil and that's how you get a lot of soya bean oil out there uh, in, around the globe but then protein was always a waste stream or something that was not really used as much and you know people eventually found ways to make protein concentrates and isolates from it and they have also functionalized soy a lot but the issue with soy is that soy is an allergen and soy you know in the process of <clears throat> process of making it more efficient was also subjected to genetic modification which is again a no go in lot of countries including india so soy is great lot of isolates out there in the market but at the same time you know soy is an allergen it is genetically modified in a lot of countries so you want to stay away from it and you want to focus on other sources of protein which are more novel which brings me to yellow peas uh, you know it has been exploited extensively as a source of commercial protein uh, because it is also high in protein it is more than 25% in protein and it has got functional proteins so pea proteins typically have a positive fat and water binding capacity uh positive emulsification capacities and uh gelation capacities and lot of companies uh including beyond including ripple for the milk part of it use pea proteins in their products wheat is again not that high in protein but you know it is it is a crop that has been optimized over decades and again the commercial production of this crop uh, wheat is huge mostly for its you know all the the carbohydrates content because bread is essentially made using wheat uh so again and gluten is also very attractive uh, when you want to use it in a plant based meat product because it gives that gluten like you know like layered structure which is desirable and it also has got good fat and water binding capacities rice pro- rice is the second largest cereal crop in the world and uh, you know it has the lowest protein content but again because it's it's such a commercial crop and it's available at you know extremely cheap prices when compared to other crops uh, people are trying to also value add uh the the protein stream that you get from rice and initially the issue with rice proteins was always solubility they were just not soluble uh but you know people have figured out extraction techniques and concentration techniques through which you know they have been able to functionalize rice proteins to make it more soluble in terms of protein functionality like one thing which you may have heard me saying again and again in the last few slides is functionality like you know this has a good functionality or this doesn't have a good functionality because functionality forms key to the product uh you know the sensory properties like the viscoelasticity the dough forming etc are dependent on the functional properties of the wheat gluten even in uh, dairy products you know the the texture what you get or the curd forming properties the unique colloidal structures are also for you know a functional property of proteins in milk uh, which are called casein proteins and even when it comes to meat uh you know the muscles uh, sorry the proteins that are found in the muscles they are, they are uh really good fat binders and really good water binders which is why it is like very fatty and juicy at the same time which is the kind of meat you would like and which is the kind of uh functionality we would like to repeat even in our plant based products so here are just a few examples uh that we have spoken about so uh the functionality solubility is typically needed in beverages and also protein concentrates and isolates water holding capacity is needed in meat cheese and yogurt gelation is needed in eggs yogurt gelatin emulsification is needed in mayonnaise ice cream salad dressing foaming is needed in whipped toppings angel food cakes structure building is needed in cakes and meat let's talk briefly about each solubility in detail uh, so first thing is solubility if your protein is not soluble then you know it might be grainy all its other components or all its other functionalities are not properly exhibited so solubility is key and typically you would want your protein to be soluble uh, so and and proteins are charged in nature right so basically they interact with you know the other amino acid chains within the protein but also with water which is also charged so uh, really the protein solubility depends on the ph of the system or the acidity of the system and you can see a graph on the screen right where we are speaking about a milk protein act- actually beta lac- lactoglobulin and as it I- approaches its isoelectric point which is basically when the charge on the system becomes zero what happens is this proteins basically aggregate with each other and settle down so they are not soluble so you can see the solubility reduces and then again away from the isoelectric point so away from 5.3 the solubility increases too another thing you can see is also uh, you know the concentration of salts in the system so you can see that at a higher 
concentration of salts, typically your solubility is lower because again, proteins are charged molecules and they get affected by system changes around them. Water holding capacity is something that is very important, uh, especially when it comes to meat like applications and it, because it really encompasses of the bound water, the hydrodynamic water and the physically entrapped water and all these three things together give you that juicy sort of feeling what you get from uh, meat like products. Typically centrifugation is the method used to determine the solubility of uh, proteins. So essentially what you do is you take proteins, you, you know, hydrate them with water, uh, keep it for some time, then you centrifuge it and you see how much water, you know, is in the supernatant versus how much is not. Excuse me. So gelation is essentially proteins uh, and water and proteins entrapping the water within them. And that's how you get your gel like structure and gelation is important in meat, but it is more important in egg like application. So essentially when you put your egg on the pan, it gels, right? So what is exactly happening over there is that the proteins are entrapping water uh, within them and that's how it is gelling. So that is gelation and again, important in few of the applications. Emulsification is important because essentially emulsification means that a protein goes into the interface of water and fat and it holds water and fat together. And this is again important in meat, eggs and dairy, all three applications, because otherwise you would see phase separation and you would not like it. You know, you would bite into a meat-like product, first bite into fat, then into protein and then into water. You don't want that. You want to bite into fat, protein and water at the same time. Foaming is very similar, similar to emulsion, but what happens is you just replace your oil phase with air phase. And that is essentially what proteins do. They, because still air and water are two different phases and you know, the proteins are holding them together, especially important in uh, cake like applications or whipping like applications. So again, when you whip up egg, uh, it foams really well, right? That is because of, you know, the proteins and eggs are, you know, have really good foaming capacity. And that is what you want with your, uh, proteins if you are looking like egg-like applications, etc. Uh, another thing is I want to talk mention was protein modification. So what happens is a lot of times you walk through the protein isolation process and you get your final protein concentrate or protein isolate, but then it is still not as functional. That doesn't mean that you cannot change its functionality further, right? So there are a lot of ways like uh, protein hydrolysis. So there is this, this process wherein you break down proteins into its individual peptides and that typically increases its solubility. But at the same time, it might, you know, reduce some other functionality. Uh, there are other methods like high pressure homogenization too, where you impact the proteins against each other uh, to again change their functionality. So, you know, you can have your protein isolate, but you can still subject it to some further physical or chemical techniques to make them more functional in a way you want them. Here is a flow chart, uh, again, kind of just, just walking through the different steps that are taken uh, to convert your seed to your protein. And we'll be talking about each of the step in detail now. So this is your seed. Again, if you, if you have a process set, say for wheat proteins, like, you know, you want to extract proteins from wheat and you have a process set, you cannot use the same process for rice. I mean, in terms, you can use the same steps, but not the same processing parameters uh, because there are changes along the way. And again, one of the most important changes being that your seed structure is very different. Like, you know, something like wheat, it has a strong brand layer, you know, it, just, just a different textural integrity. And if you apply the same milling uh, parameters to different seeds, you know, they might just break apart and you might have starch damage, et cetera, et cetera, because of which your downstream applications are also going to get off affected. So that's something just to keep in mind. Okay, so the first thing that you do once you get a seed is mill it, you know, change it into flour. Uh, sometimes that is also a debranding or dehulling operation wherein you want to remove the bran layer, uh, which we are not going to focus on over here. So we are just going to start with milling. So you mill it. Essentially, milling is milling is changing it into a smaller particle size. There are different ways to go about it. I have linked uh, the links over here. Uh, there are very these are very good uh, illustrative videos which will help you understand the process. So not really going to focus. In on it, but there is hammer mill. Essentially, it, it is a hammer against a, a sort of wall sort of a structure and you know, your seeds are basically crushed in between them to get your final product and hammer mill is still used a lot in the industry. Then there is your attrition mill, your pin mill, roller mill, your ball mill, etc. Again, with the end goal being to get a final mill product. What we are going to focus on in this lecture is, you know, a couple of papers which talk about uh, the size of your milling operation and how it impacts your final protein extraction. 
So here is a paper published in 2005, essentially, which talks about how does uh, the particle size affect the uh, extractability of the proteins. And what you see, you see a table out here, and it shows that as your mean particle size is increasing, so essentially you're not grinding as much as you need to ground or want to ground. Your extracted protein is decreasing. And your degree of hydrolysis, uh, you know, subsequent operation at the end is also decreasing. So this kind of just shows that, you know, conclusion, what you can take is smaller your particle size, higher would be your protein extraction in the later stages of the process. And this you can think about, right? Smaller your particle size, more surface area, more, uh, you know, surface area for other chemicals to act on and extract the protein out. Similar paper on here too. Here it talks about soybean and okara. And you can see that as your particle size is decreasing, so when it goes to less than 75 micrometers, your protein recovery is the highest. So something similar. So, okay, so now you have your milk flour and now you want to extract protein from it. So now you subject it to what is known as uh, the protein extraction and recovery procedures. There are different ways of going about this. Again, uh, the two prominent methods used in the industry right now one is isoelectric precipitation, wherein if you just remembered what I told you, right? At a certain pH, the protein solubility becomes really low. Uh, and this is where the proteins actually sediment out and you can separate them. Or you could also use filtration because, you know, proteins, the size of proteins is different from the size of fats, the size of carbohydrates, other impurities, etc. And you can also use it to kind of separate them out. Other techniques like evaporation, dialysis, lyophilization are also used, uh, but that's not going to be the focus of this presentation today. Like I was mentioning right now, uh, solubility of proteins is pH dependent. And again, uh, they are positively charged at a lower pH, negatively charged at a higher pH, but at the isoelectric point, they are neutral. So they are not charged at all. And that's where they separate out. And uh, this is kind of just a graph showing the solubility profile of amaranth proteins. And you can see that at a pH of four, which is the isoelectric point, uh, the solubility is the least. And this can be used to separate amaranth proteins out. Here is an interesting graph, uh, you know, again, taken from a paper, wherein they are extracting proteins from yellow peas. And what you can see here is that, you know, they have the flour, then they have adjusted it to an alkaline pH, so very high pH, eight to 11. So what happens at this pH is proteins become really soluble. So now your proteins have in the solution and then they have centrifuged it to essentially remove all the insoluble parts out. So your carbohydrates, maybe uh, your fats, uh, you know, some other components, etc. And then they have acidified it. So now to extract the proteins out. So, th so they didn't use the acidification step right at the beginning, but they used it as a second step in the process to get more uh, purif purified protein at the end. So which is, which is very interesting and which is also, uh, you know, which you can explore in your proposal. Uh, you know, if you first want to go for an alkaline step and then an ac acidification step uh, to, to kind of extract your protein. One thing to remember though, is that, uh, you know, this is great, like first using a highly alkaline operation and then acidic operation, but uh, this can also denature your proteins, uh, make your proteins less functional. So it is something you need to like balance out yield versus functionality. The second technique is uh, ultra filtration. So essentially what happens is, as I mentioned earlier, your protein is separated out based on the size of the proteins. Uh, your operating pressure is typically between 0.2 to four bars. Pore sizes can be from 10 Armstrong to 1000 Armstrong. And we have a slide coming up wherein we'll be talking about this. And uh, ultra filtration is huge. I mean, the entire milk industry in order to separate uh, the whey proteins out, what you see out on the market, use filtration technology. So it is right there. So if you want to scale it up also, one thing that you need to remember is, uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, uh, you may not have your own manufacturing facility, right? So you need to develop techniques that can be integrated into, uh, you know, other facilities which are already out there. Uh, so something like filtration, you know, maybe you could do your pilot plant trial or even your commercial trial at uh, the milk processing facilities existing in the market. Okay. So this slide basically talks about the particle sizes of different particles and uh, which technique is typically used to separate it out. So uh, if you see at the first row talks about particle sizes right from 0 0.0001 micrometer to 100 micrometers. And you can see that to the right end of the spectrum are yeasts and molds, you know, uh, typically between 10 and 100 micrometers. And you can use traditional filtration to separate them out. But then as the size of your particles starts decreasing, so 
fat globules to casein micelles to whey proteins you basically move from filtration to microfiltration to ultra filtration to nano filtration uh, and really for ions and salts etc you use reverse osmosis method so when it comes to your proteins your proteins are typically anywhere between you know it could be like 0.1 to you know 10 to even 100 micrometers so typically even when you use the ultra filtration your proteins are in your retentate and not your permeate and retentate is something that is typically held back because of the filter and not something that passes through and we'll be we'll be walking through uh, this so essentially these are the graphs kind of just showing what happens in milk industry uh, you know they they use microfiltration to separate cream out and then they use ultra filtration to separate uh, uh, the whey proteins out and then in the end they use uh, reverse osmosis method to get uh, ro concentrates etc and similarly with soybeans you know they first use ultra filtration to get their protein separation uh, reverse osmosis to get their soy solubles etc and this is what i was talking about right this is a very simple illustration of filtration so uh, you know if and you guys might have done this in the chemistry lab uh, you know at in school or even at home right you can take your just a simple filter cloth and then you can put your liquid in you'll see that there is some amount of precipitate essentially this precipitate and retentate is the same thing and then some and the particles which are smaller than the particle sizes uh, of the pores they pass through and this is your filtrate it doesn't it doesn't happen this way in the industry because what happens is if you use like a vertical setup your uh, your your, your uh, what do you say your pores typically get clogged much fa faster and there is fouling so what they typically use is a horizontal way of separating or filtering things out and essentially it's the same thing again so your retentate helps it doesn't pass through the pores whereas whatever passes through the pores is your permeate and that goes out this is typically how it happens uh, you know in a parallel fashion in an industrial setup and i have a image here kind of just showing uh, a facility a commercial scale facility so really you can't see from outside whether there's filtration going on or what is going on but then you can see all these barrels this is literally all the filters inside there and you know they are constantly separating out your permeate from your retentate uh, okay so in terms of uh, you know uh, ultra filtration you know what are the advantages of ultra filtration it's it's a more gentle method for concentrating proteins uh, and again i say this because you heard me saying that in isoelectric precipitation what happens is uh, because your ph of your system uh, is kind of affects the properties of your proteins right and it can denature them but over here you are not using acidity or any other thing to kind of uh, denature your proteins you are just using size exclusion uh, so it, it is much more gentler and there is there is proof that you know it is there is less denaturation of protein compared to precipitation and we'll be talking about this in the coming slides uh usually it gives a higher yield of proteins uh and secondly it is much faster than other methods out there to uh, dialysis and it is less expensive than other methods out there and one other thing that you could uh, which i mentioned earlier was that you could actually use a lot of facilities out there at pilot scale and commercial scale to actually carry out your filtration trials challenges associated with ultra filtration is that membrane processes uh, seldom produce two pure products <clears throat> so as i told you right proteins can vary in their size and again you know depending upon the uh, the, th the thermodynamic state of the system your protein sizes can change too so uh, membrane processes seldom produce two products so you could have your proteins in the retentate but also the permeate typically they are in the retentate but they could also be in the permeate and then you still have to go through multiple repetitions to kind of still purify your product membranes can have chemical incompatibilities with process solutions the solution what you use in which your proteins are sometimes they can be incompatible with your membrane excuse me fouling of membranes uh, is another thing which i have seen uh, in my experience is where you know your membranes they just get clogged and then your protein efficiency grows uh, goes down and you have seen like in a commercial setup it's not just about one filter right you know there are thousands of filters parallel to each other so this is something you need to keep in your mind and you need to set the right uh, 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 detection systems within each of the filters to understand which membrane is fouling which membrane is not and kind of uh, troubleshoot it in a much faster manner so now uh, as i was mentioning earlier right when you are comparing ultra filtration versus isoelectric precipitation what are the differences in between the two so uh, here is a paper wherein uh, you know they took they were isolating proteins from lentil 
using ultra filtration and also using isoelectric precipitation and just comparing them. So as you can see on your screen, right, uh, the protein recovered using ultra filtration is higher than the protein recovered using isoelectric precipitation. Whereas in, uh, whereas when it comes to like soluble dietary fiber, isoelectric precipitation has a lot more protein than ultra filtration. And we don't really want fiber in our products, right? I mean, if we want to isolate like, uh, you know, pure proteins, fiber is great, but you know, it again depends on applications. Uh, in addition to just the protein content, they also did a lot of functionality tests. So over here, what they did was they checked the solubility of different proteins. And again, they found that, you know, uh, ultra filtered proteins, what you got typically had a higher solubility, which is great. And uh, IEP proteins or isoelectric precipitation proteins had a lower solubility. Water holding capacity also, again, ultra filtration proteins had a higher water holding capacity. So again, when you're thinking about you know, making your beverages like plant-based beverages or plant-based meat, having a higher water holding capacity is important because that's how you're going to get your juiciness and avoid phase separation. Higher foaming capacity again for ultra filtration proteins. So again, when you're making your angel food cake or when you're whipping up your plant-based eggs, you want something which has a higher foaming capacity and a foaming stability. Uh, in terms of gelling and emulsification properties, again, lower value of least gelation concentration and a harder gel for ultra filter isolate. So again, a better gelation capacity and more emulsion stability too. So pretty much in, in terms of all of the aspects, ultra filtration protein performed better. But then again, this was specific to lentils, right? So this is not a blanket conclusion. And maybe ultra filtration is also a more expensive process sometimes because of just fouling of membranes, etc. So it worked in this paper, but you know, it may not apply cross spectrum. So this is something that you need to evaluate, do your experiments in house, try both, see where you're getting maximum yield, see what are, what is giving you proteins at a minimum cost, etc., and then execute that method as you scale up. So Shardul, should we take a break at this point and take any questions? Absolutely. I think this, this is a great time to just take a quick break and take in some questions from the audience. Um, awesome. Uh, I also love the chat section today because everybody's in the session, everybody's participating, DMing me on different trivia questions, a lot of fun. Great. So I think we can get started with a couple of questions. Uh, first one is from Shubham. Uh, he asks, is it necessary for us to do in-house production of protein powder isolates for product development? If we claim in our proposal that we are doing that as well, in addition to making a finished product, will it be a disadvantage for us? Uh, I'll add a little bit of context here. So Shubham, basically, like I've said multiple times, uh, if you're doing in-house production of protein powders, isolates, that is the ingredient focus, which will be in fifth category. And then obviously the first is end product development. Now you're saying if that production of protein is a key aspect to your idea of building the end product, then you might include it in your proposal in category one. Otherwise, you should focus on that idea if it's very novel in category five. But again, you cannot do that now because you've already chosen your categories, right? Um, so I would say accordingly decide the focus of how much you want to include of both of these things. But again, uh, like I said, if you're covering too much, like if you're trying to innovate in the entire value chain, then it's probably not going to fit uh, the purpose of a five page proposal. It really depends on how you convey it to us. And then the uh, judging panelists kind of convince that, okay, this idea has a merit. So I hope that answers your question. Other than that, Siddharth can add some general insights on how either of those processes can be useful or not having it in-house. Uh, yeah, so Shardul, thank you for setting that context. What I would say is that uh, you can get products from the market and make your, your final product. Uh, but what can essentially add more IP or more protection to your product is if you're also making the raw materials in-house, right? Because Essentially, you can think about this, right? You're making a plant-based dairy product and you're buying your protein from ADM or DuPont. And then someone else is also, you know, using the same proteins and making a plant-based dairy product. Then, you know, it could be somewhat similar in formulation and stuff. But now if you say that I'm going to use my own pea pro make my own pea protein in-house with, with a novel patentable uh, sort of uh, ingredient and then use it in my product. So that would be very different or that, that would differentiate you in the market, right? So it really depends on what you would like to achieve. But then again, you need to weigh pros and cons, right? If you're getting enough functionality from something that is out there in the market, uh, then you might use it. You know, the cost of developing something in-house are too high. Uh, you might not use it. Uh, yeah, so it, it's just a call that you need to take uh, if you want to develop your ingredients in-house too. Awesome. Thank you so much for that insight, Siddharth. Um, 
again a general question but you can add some insights on this because there are not many methods of extrusion but what is the best extrusion method to create plant based meat products i know it's very general so i'll make it a little better can you tell us about specific applications of low moisture extrusion and high moisture extrusion and in this cases maybe the so low moisture extrusion method might work a little better than high moisture extrusion in current context of india uh so again low moisture extrusion and high moisture extrusion are used for two different types of products right low moisture extrusion is typically used in mince products so kima like products uh, wherein you know you don't really need to have to fibrous texture i mean you still need to have it but something that is still achievable using low moisture extrusion but when we are talking about kebabs uh, you know where you know the consumer can actually wants to see the fibrous structure then you use high moisture extrusion uh, but then again low moisture extrusion is uh, also you know it's cheaper just in general high moisture extrusion is much more expensive uh, people are still working to figure out the right processing parameters which work with high moisture extrusion low moisture extrusion is typically uh, still much more research than high moisture extrusion uh, yeah so that it, it's just like two different technologies uh, for two different type of end products that you want got it yeah can you also great so um one more quick question i we have answered this question many times the extrusion one so i won't dwell on it further just to clarify the first question a little better uh, uh, shubham also asked me that it's if you are planning to use the waste streams of proteins in our products and kind of justify that in our proposal won't it add cost because those waste waste stream utilization would require you know additional purifying stages ingredients and equipments but that's the whole thing right once you understand and really think about and that's what we what we've been trying to get you to do think really about the economics of the business the entire value chain the major cost of products and siddharth can talk a lot about it better uh, are uh, from the side streams you know it's a lot of waste material so once you extract protein what do you do with other things and if you cannot find a commercial feasibility for it and cannot justify it then your pro- then your idea becomes slightly impractical because what are you going to do with all of the side streams so siddharth just some addition here Uh, i agree with chadol right so uh, say if you are making proteins from yellow peas right and you have 25% protein so essentially you are taking 100 grams of input and getting 25 grams of output but you still have this entire 75 grams of a mixture of fats and fibers and starches and sugars uh, so at the beginning it might seem like a capital investment to kind of you know functionalize them or do some product development with them etc etc but if you can actually sell them along with your protein then it just becomes uh, beneficial in terms of cost right over time absolutely yeah great we can move to a next question um, can you talk about the methods since we are on this uh, you know uh, question of waste stream by product utilization what 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 ultra filtration is one can you tell us a little bit more some given some more examples of how certain crops like indian pulses maybe you know indian um you know lentils all of those things could be used a little better millets uh yeah so that's a that's a very good question right so i would say that you know one company which you all probably must look into is ingredion uh they have got literally 100 plus queues of different starches and fibers etc and each one has got a different functionality so you call up ingredion and you be like hey i want something i want a starch which is which is going to help me with freeze thaw stability and they'll have like couple of products for you you call them up and you tell them i want something which will give me good water binding capacity and they have that so essentially when you get a starch be from any indigenous crops or anything it may not be very functional right at the beginning uh but there are processes as i mentioned earlier right there is hydrolysis uh, there is like high impact uh, sort of homogenization technologies using which you can modify the functionalities uh, so i would say yeah i mean look at your starch uh, you know there are also a few good textbooks on carbohydrate chemistry starch chemistry etc uh, which you can refer to uh, in order to even valorize uh, your starch and your carbohydrate components awesome yeah and somebody in the comment section wrote to me when i asked have you seen such interesting case studies of use of byproducts sunflower oil cake is used for you know getting soluble protein concentrates and isolates so in that case so solu- a uh, sunflower oil cake and this is an example from shagufta is basically uh, a byproduct or a waste stream from local oil manufacturing right and basically you're deriving proteins out of a waste so ultimately that is also a great approach and perspective to things can you look at ingredients which are currently by products of uh, you know existing products in the market that are being uh, thrown away or being disposed of or probably not being uh, really uh, 
really worked upon in terms of extracting the most protein out of it and what if that protein is functional in that case you've hit a lottery because somebody else is already working on the entire business plan of using the uh, other components of your protein rich source and you just get the waste at probably affordable cost you're also at the same time taking on cost from them because you're kind of using it adding value to it so you'll get the raw material at a cheaper cost so many different perspectives to think about it right so that yeah absolutely uh, and that that's what we discussed right the reason why you know soy protein is out there in the market uh, was because it was a by product of some other industry or even for that example like wheat protein or wheat gluten it was a by product of some other industry so similarly you know sunflower proteins could be the next big thing you know if it has it has been used to make sunflower oil and if someone can actually show that they are functional easy to extract from the sunflower cake uh, you know it, it, and as shardul mentioned right because someone else is doing the entire value chain for you and now you just have to use these products which no one is even using and you can make protein from it awesome again i'll request everybody to send in questions not through the chat box but through the q and a box um so to answer anirudh's question estimates are fine like you know this is ideation competition we have covered this question many times so you don't have to give the exact amounts of the final product and i'm just going to mark this as answered and then we have one more question uh so kavya says it might be a naive question but the protein functionality will be the greater important parameter right rather than the yield what are your thoughts on protein yield versus protein functionality when you are you know selecting a source of uh, ingredient sadat yeah so protein functionality is important but if uh so okay so if you are making your protein in house and again your yield is very low you will see that the cost economics is just not working out uh similarly you know if you are not working in house but you are procuring proteins from some other company they will just sell you at a higher price right because in say from 100 grams essentially and if they are not using any other side streams right and they are putting in some amount to make uh 20 grams of protein but now they are moved to some other crop which is more functional but now they are just getting some 7 or 8 grams of protein from it so they'll just sell you at a higher price right uh to recover their costs of processing so yeah and it might not work with the uh, the pricing of your product so i think it has to be a good balance between functionality and uh, pricing or yield yeah again like you might have expected whoever asked the question it's always a depends you know it all depends on what your specific idea is how you're generating value and that's the whole point of this competition for you to critically think about the entire value chain and then really understand where are the white space opportunity in the indian context how the indian food industry is structured so obviously a lot of reading a lot of understanding of these things online there are so many things available as industry reports google things find out and then critically think better about whatever you currently ideating on i think we'll take one more question and then get started with your slides again siddharth so that we can have a, a lot of time at the end as well for the q and a um okay so pranjali asks how to obtain protein isolates free of any flavor does any of these methods help with the same so it's basically talking about removing the off taste or you know uh, after taste of flavor profiles which are not very appealing to the end consumer technologies to do that have you seen any interesting examples of that being done etc uh that's a good question right i mean plant so this really de- uh, dives into flavor chemistry right so essentially the flavor what you get uh, is because of individual flavor components and these components sometimes can be present in oil uh, of the crops so the oils that are present and even though you use a defatting step there can still be some oil and your fat content of your flour and it could be there it could also be uh, just the 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 flavor components found in the starch co- like the the carbohydrate component or the protein component and that's why we al- always say that you know typically try to use protein isolates or higher purity of protein because typically the flavor components associated with the carbohydrates present they kind of get eliminated by, during your protein isolation stage uh, but there are protein flavors that are associated with uh, like the, the the proteins too and uh, that's a great question people are working on different techniques uh you know even post you make the product right you might still have some uh beaniness or grassiness and you know there are beaniness maskers grassiness marks maskers that are being used to kind of uh suppress or eliminate these off flavors uh, at the end of the value chain but uh, to answer your question specifically i would say higher purity always means less off flavors so you know try to get a protein which is very pure 
and uh, again my answer is going to be uh, like it really depends from crop to crop after that certain crops you know if you achieve a decent level or a high level of purity the off flavor might be less whereas for certain crops even if you get a high level of protein purity you might still get some some detectable off flavor uh, so if you have any specific questions uh, you know you could reach out to us and we could answer or you we could discuss that yeah as long as it's not directly tying into their proposal but uh... uh like like siddharth said again a lot of these things depend i would encourage you to go through the company database that was provided to you filter out companies that are focusing on your kind of ideas for the proposal understand their models look up articles uh online about those companies and there are 400 plus companies so there'll be enough for each category you know everybody's innovating in ingredients as well uh, you know specific to the topic of this webinar um do you want to take one more question siddharth or should we get moving no let's let's take one more question Okay, um. So somebody asks, while trying to recreate the texture of meat seafood, should we focus more on alternative protein that closely mimic the microstructure of the native protein, or just look for a suitable protein by looking at their gelling and soluble capacity, heat stability, and other such stats? Like which approach makes more sense? If somebody something's missing from this approach, what would you recommend? Like a holistic perspective of looking at an ingredient. That's a good question, right? So again. so when we are talking about the structure of a product right i mean okay so i mean if you just open meat science 101 right you will see that the structure of meat is very different like you will see that you know muscle there is a muscle fiber but they are aligned together now these form a bunch and they are again aligned together and that's and what you really see on the screen it's just like sort of one dimensional thing acha like they, you know there are a lot of like fiber like you know strands and stuff but inside each strand there are like multiple strands uh this is because these proteins are again fibrillar in nature and that's how they are structured so when it comes to making plant based meat now these first of all these proteins are globular right and at multiple levels right from a macro to microstructural level they are not in this fiber oriented format and essentially that's when you use extrusion technology to kind of align them into this fibrous format and that's what you see uh so answering your specific question basically you i i don't know maybe uh, there are some proteins which are i which are like fibrillar right from the beginning like who have the same microstructure as animal based proteins but this would be something you know you you could look up uh, but as far as i know typical sources of you know plant proteins that have been used they don't have the same microstructure as animal based proteins but that's when you use different extra, uh, extrusion technology or shear cell technology to kind of get them into that and uh, so and now okay so this is one part to it right now like following it it further now you have two sources of proteins right one is where you have gotten it aligned but they don't have good functionality so they might still align themselves in the form of fibers but they don't hold water well they don't emulsify well etc so your final product won't be as good uh, but now you have another set of protein uh, you know which are again layered and now they have good uh, emulsification good water holding capacity so you they'll just be better from a sensory perspective so uh so i would i would say focus on proteins which have got good, good functionalities uh structure is something again you need to evaluate using extrusion methods so it's a combination of both proteins that can give you that fibrillar structure via extrusion and proteins that also have a uh, good emulsification and you know water holding capacity awesome for that comprehensive response i think it helps people think better about such things and i'm 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 sure that all our answers when we answer them a little bit with how people should think about uh their question or the solution or the answer or the path to finding the answers for those questions is obviously more important for attendees to just note in these webinars because you're never going to get specific answers for your questions uh you know in science things require a lot of time research understanding of the context and only then people can answer very specific questions so always try to derive those kind of uh, ways of thinking insights from the answers that experts talk about awesome i think we can continue with the deck and then we'll get back to the q and a in the last bit thank you siddharth okay sounds good uh, so i still have about 20 more slides so hopefully you know we can finish it in about 20 minutes and again have a uh, lot of time for q and a's uh, so okay yeah that so, just so means that people should submit their questions as in when they come uh, so that you know we have a nice group of questions at the end to you know cover the q and a session thank you perfect so uh, talking about the value chain and moving along uh, so now we first spoke about different milling operations then we spoke about different protein extraction methods and now the protein what you have extracted be it isoelectric precipitation or be it ultrafiltration these are wet proteins right 
I mean, you always heard me talking about, uh, you know, these proteins are in solution and you precipitate it using water as a medium or, you know, you filtrate it, but then again, there's a certain solvent that you use. Uh, you can't really sell your protein in this wet format because again, you can think about it, right? Now this has proteins, it has got some amount of sugars, etc. And, you know, it is the perfect medium for microbial growth. Uh, and also, you know, you know, just having to ship something in a liquid format just takes up a lot of space. You need to have cold chain, et cetera, et cetera. So people don't prefer that uh, both from a demand side and a supply side. And they prefer, uh, you know, selling dried proteins. So now the next step is drying, pro drying step. And this is a key because now you have done everything right. Up to this point, you also need to make sure that you dry the proteins in the right way, such that uh, you get you retain the functionality of those proteins. The two operations are uh, spray drying and freeze drying. Uh, I'm going to be focusing more on spray drying because that is an industry standard. But we'll just be walking through, uh, you know, these two. Just be comparing these two things. Freeze drying can take a lot of time, and freeze drying essentially means that I freeze the product and then I basically dry it. So it literally skips the uh, the liquid step, uh, but it is a gentler process. It's a much longer time consuming process as you might think. First you have to freeze the product, then you have to dry the product. So it takes a lot of time. Uh, it's very capital intensive. Uh, it is uh, it is a batch process. You can't do it in a uh, controlled format. But then you know the advantages include protein activity, right? You know it's it's much more gentler on the proteins. So your proteins have not really denatured because of this process. They are much more functional, etc. Now, when you talk about spray drying, it is much faster and we'll be diving into the details in the next slides. Uh, the capital cost is also less because, because it has been standardized over some time now and it's also a continuous process as opposed to a batch process and batch processes are typically more expensive. But what happens is because you are using high temperature conditions, uh, high shear conditions sometimes, the uh, protein loses its functionality or, uh, and that's why you know the protein activity is reduced. Also, what happens is because of this, thermal treatment and there's a chance that the protein might get charred and because of which it could get some some type of odor but then again these are things that you do r and d in right so there are companies just specializing in you know spray drying your proteins or companies just selling the right type of spray dry so this is a very big area of research that is going on so uh, talking about spray dryer essentially there are three key components as marked on the screen by one two and three one is the atomization, second is the actual drying that happens, and third is the particle collection. So when we talk about atomization, it is essentially the liquid now, what you have gotten post your protein extraction stage, it is sent into an atomization chamber where it is broken down into a stream of fine droplets, and these droplets later are dried. Uh, but then this process of uh, breaking a stream down into uh, fine droplets can be done in various ways. There is rotary atomizer, there is hydraulic at atomizer, there is pneumatic nozzle atomizer, etc. And each of these gives a different type of uh, spray configuration. You know, sometimes these droplets can be coarse, sometimes they can be fine, etc. I'm not going to dive deeper into this, but people who are interested in this, I would, you know, ask you to read up more on this. The second is droplet to particle conversion. And this is very interesting, right? There are again, three ways of going about this. One is called the co, uh, the co current flow in which what happens is your the droplets and the air, which is used as a drying medium, both come from the top and essentially it is dried and then your air exits and so does your particles. The issue with uh, this, this method is that uh, the residence time is much lower and uh, the, the particles also come in contact with your really hot air right at the beginning. So there is some chance of denaturation. The second one is the counter current in which your feed comes from the top, whereas your air comes from the bottom. So what happens over here is that your air doesn't, your really hot air, and you can see that the temperature is about, you know, I can't see because I'm in, it's about 360 is what I see. And this is really hot, right? But by the time it reaches, it hits your particles, it has reduced slightly in temperature because of which your chances of your protein denaturing is less. Uh, and what happens in this is also you get more residence time because your particles are coming down, your air is going up. So there is some sort of your, your particle, the velocity of your particles going down is reduced. So you get a little more residence time. Uh, but then what happens is even though your particles are hit at a lower air temperature, which is beneficial in one aspect in terms of preserving its functionality, it is not beneficial in one aspect because they may not get dried enough. And you know, you might still get your final dried uh, mixture, which has a high uh, moisture content. 
so there is another method which is kind of a combination of co-current and counter-current in which your particles come your feed comes from below and your air comes from the top so you get the right amount of uh, residence time the right amount of heat impact and then they exist but then again there are advantages disadvantages of you know each of these methods and you know it's you could read up more literature on it to kind of narrow down which uh, process do you want to use the third phase is once you get your dry particles you need to collect them in the form of chamber and uh, this typically <clears throat> people use uh, what is known as cyclone separators and uh, it's it's again if you look at cyclone separator in process it's very interesting but essentially it's a, it's a combination of uh, centrifugal force and you use this force to essentially collect the particles uh, at the bottom of the chamber now when it comes to the processing parameters as you saw drying drying is a complex operation there are different stages involved each of which can affect your final product functionality so first is your atomization pressure because this determines the size of your droplets and the coarseness or fineness of your droplets, which are going to impact your downstream operations, the feed flow rate uh, in your drying chamber or even in your atomization chamber. Like if you have a lot of feed flowing, uh, then, you know, your air that you supply might not be, you know, enough to like dry all the particles. So you might be getting uh, less dry particles, uh, which you do not want the feed viscosity. Again, this impacts how much atomization can actually take place. The inlet temperature, you can use hot air, uh, lighter air, etc. depending on how much drying you want, how much uh, functionality do you want to preserve, et cetera. Residence time inside the chamber. So again, all of these parameters are going to impact your final properties. Uh, and as I was mentioning earlier, uh, consider considerable amount of protein can be denatured or inactivated uh, due to thermal and air interface related stresses. And what happens typically a result is that they lose their solubility, these powders. And once they lose the solubility, they start losing other functional properties too. So something to keep in mind, a uh, lot of times, how can you prevent this denaturation is using low molecular weight surfactants, uh, which can displace the proteins from the interfaces and thereby minimizing the contact area with air or during the automation and uh, preventing denaturation. So really what you saw till now is that getting a final functional isolate that you can use in your final product depends upon a lot of things, right? It really starts off with your source, whether the source actually has those functional proteins or no, it starts off with that. Then it goes through the entire process of, you know, protein extraction. And then even after that, you know, you still have this whole complex food product system. So you could use your model systems and be like, okay, my protein is like emulsifying really well. But once you mix it with other food components in your food system, like salts and uh, you know, other oil and other proteins and carbohydrates, it may not function. So you constantly need to validate uh, any run you do with the protein, what you're making by putting it in the food product and seeing that is it actually working or not. In terms of protein concentrates and isolates out in the market, uh, you know, there are a lot of companies out there uh, working on them. And here are a list of companies. So you can see that, you know, Sole, ADM, Cargill, you know, all have, you know, some, some sort of soy protein concentrate or isolate out there in the market. Cargill also has a wheat protein isolate. There are new companies coming up too, uh, which are kind of specializing in canola protein, like BioX, uh, Gurkhan, potato protein with Solanic, etc. And you can check these websites out to see what they are doing. Next, next thing is fat. So that pretty much ends our uh, topic of uh, proteins and proteins are very important in creating plant-based uh, meat and dairy products. But to complement the proteins are also, uh, you know, other, other important ingredients, right? And the one at the top of the list is fats and fats are an important component of taste and mouthfeel of animal based meat. And a typical problem that you'll find with a lot of uh, plant-based products is that people will say they are not fatty enough. Uh, this is because the fats uh, that are used in animal based products or the fats, they are very embedded with protein. So you could look up some papers. Uh, you know, look at confocal laser scanning microscopy of, you know, any animal based products. And you'll see that the fat, water and proteins are intermeshed. Whereas with plant based products, you know, that is typically an issue. Uh, so that is one thing. And also flavor, a lot of like flavor components. So when we say this, this is very chicken like, or this is very egg like the flavors are in the dissolved in fats. So fats are a critical aspect in plant based products too. Uh, so that's why you, you'll see that a lot of companies like Impossible and Beyond use coconut oil uh, in their in, as their ingredient because these are saturated and typically animal fats are also saturated. So current strategies for optimizing fats and plant-based meat products, one is what I just mentioned, using highly saturated fats and second, 
blending different fats uh, to kind of combine their fatty acid profiles, their sensory profiles, their melting points, etc., to to get your final right flat blend and the right type of fattiness and flavor to the product. Potential strategies for optimizing fats. There are again a lot of companies just working on creating the right type of fats. One is oleo gel. So essentially, this is your gel, but instead of water, you have your fat, uh, which again gives a different sort of fattiness in your mouth. Uh, secondly, creating mottling in whole muscle type products and mottling in ground products. So what this means is if you look at, uh, I believe it's Beyond Burger, you'll see that it is marbled. So essentially they have used cocoa butter because if you look at ground beef products, they typically have fats in the form of marbles, tiny marbles, and consumer really likes it. So they have used, uh, you know, this technology called marbling to actually get this in place. So that's on fats. Then we have binders too. So binders are these functional ingredients. So you can get you know, a lot of functionality through proteins, but you still need some additional functionality through some other ingredients like free store stability or some water holding capacity, etc. And this you can get through uh, these binding ingredients. Typically, these are gums and some forms of carbohydrates, etc. So proteins is something that you already get, but then we, we talk about polysaccharides in these slides. Uh, so you know these could be starches. And as I just mentioned, right, you can call up ingredient and basically get any skew, any functionality of starch. And so these are like, you know, modified starches from corn, potato, tape, tapioca, etc. You also have your fibers, your methyl cellulose, uh, P fibers, citrus fibers, which are again used. Methyl cellulose is commonly used because it's just a very good structure binding agent, but it is not, uh, it doesn't have a very clean label uh, sort of perspective. So people are actually trying to use P fiber, citrus fiber to actually get uh, methyl cellulose off their label. And then people also use a combination of different gums like konjac, locust, bean, carrageenan, and et cetera, to get the right sort of juiciness to their products. Flavoring again, meat flavors are complex. Uh, you know, they are a combination of umami flavor and typical meat like flavors. And uh, this is a science being studied upon by a lot of flavor companies globally. Typically they use uh, you know, gas chromatography to basically identify what, what are the individual flavor components in meat. And how can I get each of this flavor component in, in the flavor concoction, what I prepare, which can be, then be used in a plant-based product. Uh, so if you look at this graph, right, they did a GC on cooked beef and they found 880 volatile compounds, all of which finally gave, okay, this product is very beefy in nature. So how do you replicate this? This is a big science. Uh, and again, a lot of research is going on. And, you know, for people over here who are trying to optimize for fat, uh, so for flavors to, you know, have in the proposal, uh, flavor as the USP of their product. This is something uh, you need. You probably want to look into. People are using encapsulated flavor techniques, and this is a, a interesting, right? A lot of times, what happens is flavor companies make this flavor concoction, which as soon as you open it, it's like, oh, this is so chicken-like, and you add it to your product. Uh, it's still chicken-like, but then you need to understand that you're going to be heating this product. You're going to pass it through a three to four month shelf life. So before the consumer actually tastes it, it is going to go through a lot of processing time, etc. And your flavor is typically lost. So can you encapsulate it so that the flavor is released only when the consumer is cooking the product or when eating the product, etc. So a lot of work going on in this uh, area too. Another important thing is color, right? Uh, because imagine if you get a chicken product, which is green in color, you wouldn't like it, right? You want chicken to look like chicken. Uh, when it is plant-based. So if it is a red meat product, uh, typically it is high in myoglobin. Uh, you know, you might want to use a different sort of color concoction versus like if it is a white meat product, which is low in myoglobin, you'd want to use a different uh, color concoction. Different companies have different strategies. So Beyond uses beetroot juice, which is red in color. So it gives that raw sort of a feeling, but when you cook it, it undergoes melon browning, becomes brown, and that's how your beef product looks. Uh, Impossible uses a different strategy of soil leg hemoglobin, and I think we have a slide coming up next to talk about it. Uh, so different strategies to get your final sort of product. Uh, this talks about the soil leg hemoglobin, right? And uh, which is used as a color additive in Impossible's uh, plant-based beef burger. And uh, Impossible actually uses a fermentation platform to create this product. And what they figured out was that the color and flavor in a typical beef-like product is imparted by this component called heme, which is present in blood. And then they figured out that the same heme is present in the roots of soybean plants. But then imagine if they had to pluck all the soybean plants out to then use this heme compound. It would basically spoil the entire sustainability sort of angle, right? So what they did was they took the DNA out of a soybean plant. They inserted this DNA in a yeast so that now this yeast started making this 
soil like hemoglobin compounds and then they essentially use this as a color and flavor additive in their product so very interesting this is a usp of their product too they have a grass approval uh, now on the soil like hemoglobin and also color additive approval so something for you to think about as you're making your products so i think that's what we have uh, in this so we essentially we delved into proteins then we spoke a little bit about fats binders flavors and colors uh, uh, and then in the next session we'll be talking about how do you kind of blend all of these together to make your final plant based meat product awesome i think we covered a lot of ground and now we have a lot of time for q and a and i see a lot of questions coming in as well so we'll just give a minute for this and then get started uh is everybody still with me can i see a raise of hands that i understand you are still here attentive and enjoying the session awesome you can lower your hands so uh, like i said i'll uh, give a short poll as always so that we can gauge how you finding the session and in the meanwhile we'll also start with the q and a so i'm going to make the poll live and you can take it now and then obviously you can take it towards the end as well and after a few minutes so that you know you can also evaluate the q and a session from today uh and this is just an example right this resource was with you for like a month more than a month now since it was first given to you in phase 1 but now you've attended you've kind of really engaged with the presentation and now you've learned much more than you would have probably by just by reading the resource uh and also because you're paying close attention during these two hours right and there's a specific workshop mentioned for this we cannot do that with every resource and that's why self education and lot of these things becomes very important that's why revisiting all the resources that we shared with you in phase 1 is a key to getting to a very good proposal i was speaking with few candidates recently uh and then i was slightly disappointed by the use of words like farm meat or you know uh, veggie meat because consumer study shows for and it has shown time and again that that those are not really great ways of branding your product it just alienates a lot of consumers which are flexitarians so just basic concept price says convenience the things we keep talking in our webinar series in our podcast episodes i think that is all very very valuable and if you stick to it and kind of think of a proposal it um, i mean just that amount of effort really improves your proposal and probably puts it in the top 25% directly just making sure that everything we have talked about through these resources these concepts are well implemented and thought through when you're thinking about your ideas as well great um having said that and assuming you guys have gotten a couple of minutes of break we'll get started with the q and a bit um so siddharth the most reported question right now is from ananya and she asks how would the presence of fat in raw material affect extrusion what changes would have to be made to the process provided we don't use isolates or concentrates and you can set aside the protein functionalization perspectives and give other you know uh, perspectives in here as well uh okay so in general what happens is so you need some amount of fat right uh, in creating your product and you know some amount of fat uh, even in extrusion process is good but if you have excessive fat it typically causes uh, slipping in between the screw and the barrel and uh, yeah what happens because of that is not enough amount of pressure is created not enough amount of heat is generated so you might not get the right amount of texturization so that is something to keep in mind uh, as you as you are defining your uh, extrusion strategy yeah thank you siddharth and just one more bridging point here we did a design thinking workshop yesterday we have a business model ca uh, canvas session coming with cai co day after uh, so the point is i'm assuming a lot of team members and teams in general are diverse and these sessions scientific sessions are being attended by the scientific participants so that they can draw more insights and probably uh, the people in your team who are not from a science background are attending those sessions and it's very important for both of these you know elements of a team to go back and discuss this a uh, different aspects of thinking about your proposal scientifically and also from a commercial market business standpoint because unless you marry those two perspectives your proposal is going to lack uh, in some element or the other so uh, just a quick guideline there and we can get back to our q and a um, so the next question is for uh, vigneshwaran and he asked is the protein to be isolated or uh, i don't really understand this question siddharth so we can skip it and how can we measure the water binding and immersion uh, capacities of proteins uh okay 
So water binding capacity is typically measured using, uh, I think both are measured using, okay, let me talk about water binding first. It's measured using centrifugation um, method. So what you do is you take your protein, uh, you dissolve it uh, or you mix it with water and then you centrifuge it. Now you can look at uh, specific papers which talk about specific methods like, you know, keep it hydrated for a certain amount of time, rotate it at specific G for a specific amount of time. And that's a simpler way of measuring water binding. There are also other complex ways in which you can store the mixture and essentially see how the water is separating out or how you're seeing some sort of sedimentation happening, etc. cetera. Uh, emulsion capacity is again, a simpler method could again be what I just mentioned, but again, that is not, you know, like very, very accurate. So you can look at these instruments called Turbiscan meters. And these essentially what they do is you can make an emulsion and you can store it. And essentially this, this equipment keeps scanning your, your while in which you have prepared this emulsion. And essentially it kind of detects even a small change, like some of your oil and water are separating or some sort of creaming is happening. So you can look at it and essentially that would give you your emulsion capacity. Thank you, Siddharth. Uh, and what are the best methods for plant-based milk with respect to ultrafiltration and isoelectric pre precipitation? Any comments on pseudo cereals in terms of plant-based milk? Um, I don't fully understand that question, but elements of it, if you understood, you can answer that. Again, a key key aspect to ans asking questions is adding as much context you can so that it's easier to answer specifically. Okay, uh, so I I don't understand the question very well too, but I think what maybe uh, the person is trying to ask is the protein what you create. Uh, for making plant-based milk, uh, can you create it using ultrafiltration or isoelectric precipitation? And for the source, again, can you use pseudo cereals? So again, my answer is going to be really depends. Uh, typically, you saw that at least in lentils, ultrafiltration gave you a more functional isolate when it came to solubility, water holding capacity, etc. But it may not be applicable to all sources. And it could also happen that once you change the conditions of your isoelectric precipitation, you might get a better protein isolate in terms of functionality. So again, the answer depends. Uh, I would say the person who's asked this question, essentially read up uh, on more on your source and see that if there are any scientific papers out there, which have compared these two methods for your source, and then essentially take a call. Awesome. Um, next question is from Prabhu and he asks, in the heat denaturation water extraction process, protein is first denaturated and then sugars are separated by dissolving them in hot water. Since this is a solid liquid extraction, it is similar to acid wash process, but the former process uses denaturation, uh, insoluble of protein, and uh, latter uses isoelectric precipitation. Will denaturation of protein in the particular process prior to extrusion affect the functionality of the protein since denaturation leads to loss of functionality of the protein? Yeah, interesting question, Siddharth. So, So I'll, I'll answer the second part of the question first. Will denaturation of protein in a particular process uh, affect the functionality of the protein? So yes, a denaturation def definitely affects the functionality. And a simple way to think about it is, think about eggs, right? Essentially you take eggs and then you can use it in cakes, you can use it in any other application. But now imagine you like boil the egg and then you use that boiled egg in making cakes. It doesn't work that way, right? So, you know, protein has denatured and it has lost its functionality. Uh, in terms of heat denaturation water extraction process, I don't really understand this question or maybe I've not worked with this process. So uh, if you give us some time, I'll, I'll just take a look at it and then I'll get back to you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Um, an important attribute of meat is that it should be moist once cooked. However, when developing a plant-based uh, product or plant-based meat, how will we ensure the balance between making the product sufficiently moist and yet not being susceptible to microbial attack? Like shelf life versus, again, uh, sensory considerations as in that. Are there, ways, uh, are there ways in which moisture can be made into a bound form and less available to microbes? Uh, yeah, so that, that is a way, right? I mean, a lot of... So one thing is that once you make your product, and that's what Impossible and Beyond do that, they freeze their product. And essentially the consumer thaws it out and then they just cook it and have it. So that way water is preserved. Uh, and again, freezing basically prevents any microbes from growing. Another way of doing about it is retorting. So again, there also essentially you're vacuum packing it and then you're retorting it. 
So your water is still in the product. And once you have retorted it, it is shelf stable too. So the microbes are not going to grow in, in it. So there are different ways of ensuring uh, how to go about it. Like you probably shouldn't, you know, just refrigerate it for like 60 days or, you know, just leave it out on, on, on the, you know, uh, at ambient temperatures without going through like the retorting process, etc. But yeah, freezing or retorting typically are the way people go about it. Sometimes refrigeration too, but then again, your shelf life would be much shorter. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, all the plant-based raw materials have some amount of carbohydrates. How can we uh, make it complete protein product? Uh, and again, we can talk more about enriching with different protein sources. How do we achieve the end uh, highly soluble uh, protein claim that we want in the end product. So uh, this just goes back to this purifying and purifying, right? So when I even talk about ultra filtration, uh, companies are typically using multiple rounds of ultra filtration to kind of get concentrate the protein further and further and further. And same thing with isoelectric precipitation too. So it's just about, you know, multiple steps in order to keep concentrating it. That's the that's the way to go about, uh, you know, getting rid of the carbs and any other components. Yeah, and then again, you can try different sources, mixing them together. You might have seen multiple startups are using, say, six, seven different eight sources of plant-based protein so that at the end, they're getting a very complete kind of a profile that is mandated uh, maybe by regulatory standards or just for ensuring nutrition in your end product. So again, depends on, on the approach you're taking. Um, any insights on the use of recombinant proteins in the plant-based meat sector, the procedures and, uh, you know, what we're looking at in this area. So, I mean, you can suggest maybe some good resource to read up about this and then candidate can go back and take a look at it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like the most famous resources, I mean, definitely the soil like hemoglobin, but there's also beta lactoglobulin made by perfect day. And there is uh, ovalbumin made by a lot of foods. Uh, but typically I would say that because I also see a question on GMO recombinant proteins are typically GMO and, uh, which are not allowed in India. So if you're thinking from an Indian perspective, you should not think about GMO, even though your final product may not have GM protein, but given your process had some GM component to it, it would, it's a no go. Awesome. Why don't you pick the next question? Siddharth? Okay. So it's by Shubham Banerjee. Protein functionality, though similar, might be faintly different for meat and seafood products. But apparently, very less studies on texturization technology of seafood is out there. Though we have attended a seafood lecture, we'll still there's a dearth of machines technology availability in India. Suppose we claim that we the technology from abroad. Will it be a credit credible thing yeah. to do? I so, can add a little bit of perspective. Yeah. So, yeah, please go on and then I'll add to it. So I, I can tell you one thing in terms of when people are saying like technology from abroad. Right now, a lot of companies are still making this technology for their own products, right? Uh, it's, I feel it's still not in a stage where people are going to license their technology. Uh, so the technology, what they are developing, they are going to be using uh, for their own products. And then you're right that, you know, there is not a lot of uh, info, uh, academic info or, you know, even companies for, for that matter uh, in terms of seafood. But then I believe that the basic text, you know, the functionality still remain the same that, right. And you probably need a little bit more of water holding capacity, a little bit less of some other functionality, et cetera, to get that right salmon texture or pomfrey texture, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so, so you're right. Uh, yeah. You know, there's, there's less seafood, uh, sort of information, but then again, it's not vastly different from meat. Got it. And you're correct. Uh, plant-based meat, plant-based seafood. That's why it's the most, uh, you know, white space category, right? That's why we focus on plant-based seafood and also have made sure that there's at least one winner uh, in phase three that goes from phase two into that category. That's the whole reason that, you know, it's kind of overlooked compared to plant-based dairy and plant-based sex globally right now. But having said that, all the five categories and the entire sector that we're innovating is in itself a very new sector. And I think your angle of asking this was basically if we take a science or scientific concept or technology from abroad, is that credible? So yeah, science and technology is universal and you, you're just trying to innovate and improve it in India. So from, if, if the question was from that angle, certainly do it, uh, you know, and kind of find better ways of doing it locally. Maybe there's a key component 
or key manufacturer that already does it and you're just modifying it and then that would fit very well into the Indian supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. If there are um, simpler ways of texturizing things which are not wanting or requiring the use of an extruder, that's another great way of thinking about it as well. Um, next is most of the time we're talking about only protein, but uh, meat has micronutrients as well. Uh, how can we come up with the whole product by simply fortification or are there any other approaches to go on about thinking about this? And I know Siddharth, you've been thinking about nutrition as well for these products in India. So some insights there. Uh, yeah, so this is a, again, a very valid question. Uh, first thing is that, you know, there are different ways to go about it. Uh, you can look at uh, biofortification. You can just type it in Google and you can also look at, you know, Ikrasat in Hyderabad has done a lot of work where they have fortified I believe zinc and iron into pearl millet, sorghum, finger millet, etc. So that's one way, right? So instead of using a crop which has got say X amount of zinc, I can use a crop which has got 2X amount of zinc and then I've literally fortified it right from the get-go, uh, which is which is great. But that sometimes it does have challenges of like sensory, etc. Uh, so that is one thing that you need to evaluate. Uh, in, but then again, if, if not for biofortification, if you probably look at beyond label or impossibles, it does have a lot of ingredients just to fortify it with vitamins and minerals. So that's another way of going about it. The third way of the third thing to think is a lot of companies and you can look at Canada. It actually has like a particular regulation. It says that if you are making a plant-based chicken breast, or if you are making a plant based pork chop, it needs to satisfy these, 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 these micronutrient requirements. Otherwise you cannot sell it in market. Uh, and it would be good uh, to also like think about think about it that way, right? So if you are making a plant-based chicken breast, essentially make it uh, equally nutritious from a micronutrient perspective to as the animal-based chicken breast. So that's that's a good way to think. And I think in a in a country, uh, especially countries like India or developing countries where nutrition is something that needs to be worked on, uh, I, I think that's that's a great idea. Yeah, and people who are thinking in this direction, again, it's not just about saying we are putting this, we are putting that, you are putting a slew of micronutrients and macronutrients, so it's nutrient dense. Just claiming those things and just thinking about it is not innovation. What are the specific ways in which you're solving a problem? Like thousands of people are currently working to do exactly similar things, right? Across diets, because India has a lot of problems with nutrition, malnutrition, stunted growth, etc., etc., iron deficiency, and number of micronutrient deficiencies across states. So th that is how you should keep about keep a lens on this when you're thinking about ideating in this specific context. Uh, so yeah, Vigneshwaran asked, why are we talking about protein isolation by the protein when the protein could be isolated uh, rather than we can process the source with a whole sum of protein. So obviously, uh, what he's trying to say is why do we isolate rather than focusing on sources which are more wholesome, you know, kind of a composition of proteins to start with. And there are multiple difficulties, obviously, proteins getting uh, denatured, lowering the quality through the processing. That's why we have to add it again, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And Siddharth can obviously very well talk about all of this. Uh, yeah, so wholesome protein, essentially, you know, you will probably have about 30-35% protein, right? But you'll have a lot of starches, a lot of fat, etc. So even though it might look good from a label perspective, you're still going to get the same issues now. Like you're going to get the carbohydrates, you're going to get the fats, etc, which are going to impact the texture and flavor of your product. So that's why people want sources uh, which are high, like protein isolates. And if you look at meat products, I believe they are either zero or like really low in carbohydrates. Yeah, and again, it's about so the whole process of deconstructing these uh, sources of proteins, carbohydrates into individual components is then you can use that individual source in many different universal applications. Whereas this wholesome source of protein in its raw form cannot be used to do that. And that's the whole science and the advanced aspect of this food technology sector, which is why it has grown so much. You know, people have figured how to do that. So it's kind of going against um, the thought process here in many ways. So you'll have to think a little bit better about this. Uh, if you want to combine any other food having low water activity compared to the high water activity of the high extrusion, I mean, HMMC uh, derived meat, how can we stop the moisture migration? Hmm, interesting. Hmm. That's a good question, right? Uh, so moisture is going to, I mean, typically, so that, you know, I, I don't know the answer to this. But then again, what I would ask, you know, people to like look at is uh, this was also issue with a lot of like cream biscuits, right? 
from what I remember now. Uh, and essentially what they found out was they reduced the, the moisture content in the cream of the biscuits. But at the same time, they added in some other ingredients to still make it like juicy or have the same sort of mouthfeel. And that, you know, to some extent solved the problem. So I would ask the person to be like more innovative Think, you know, you could still like, maybe I can reduce the uh, moisture content or water activity of my high moisture extrusion meat, but at the same time still get the same fattiness and juiciness of uh, my HME product. So you could think about it that way. Uh, there could be other ways too. Uh, I, I just don't remember it on top of my head. If I do, I'll get back to Shardul and, you know, Shardul can reach out to the person. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. I think just a couple of quick follow-ups and chats about the companies you mentioned. The biofortification company from Hyderabad. Can you tell its name? Uh, and somebody also asked about um, the company you mentioned about star funct starch functionality products. Yeah, so starch products are is Ingredion. So I-N-G-R-E-D-I-O-N. And uh, so the biofortification, it's not a company. It's actually a university. Uh, it's ICRISAT, International Crop Research Institute for semi arid Tropics. Yeah, absolutely. Use of humectants by binding yeah. free water is definitely one of the solutions in such cases. Definitely. And yes. again, like you would really need a food scientist if, if there is one in your team to really think better about this. Um, you know, just read up on water activity, moisture content to different, you know, concepts and then take uh, a little bit effort and thinking how you could answer the question that was earlier asked. If we are thinking of taking a byproduct such as oil cake, um, is there any method to remove the anti-nutritional factors such as the flotoxins? Yeah, again, like there are many methods in food science. Maybe you can just shed some light on a couple of those and people can read up about it. Yeah, my answer would be the same. Uh, you know, there are ways and means of removing the anti-nutritional factors. Uh, you could use acid treatments, uh, you know, heat factors, again, separation techniques, etc., uh, to either deactivate or to remove them. So I would just recommend you guys to go through some literature. Yeah, like uh, tying up to that question, uh, regulatory aspects, you know, in the end product, are we required by law to remove all the anti-nutritional factors currently? Uh, and, uh, you know, this is tying up into the protein isolation procedures or is there some residue amount which is allowed? So basically it asks, is it compulsory to remove all the international factors when thinking about protein isolation procedures? So, you know, the simple answer to that is yes, do try to remove as many anti-nutritional factors or do try to remove them to an extent such that it is below, uh, under the acceptable limit, etc. So, uh, Again, please do go through some FSSAI regulations on, you know, uh, you know, protein isolates and what are the anti-nutritional factors and to, to what extent are they allowed. Yeah, somebody asked about fortification. If there are existing laws uh, or regulations around what things can be fortified, cannot be fortified, certainly keep them in mind, you know, while you're thinking about your proposal. And again, there are regulatory bodies like FSSAI, which might have some literature around that. So. Uh, definitely, definitely refer to it when you're thinking about by fortifying or adding nutrition in your end products. Awesome. Uh, yeah, this is such a general question. What are some pointers on extrusion method which can prevent or else avoid denaturation of proteins? It's an art, it's a science, um, and you know you have to really work with a lot of parameters to get there. But uh, any any pointers? No, I mean, just similar pointers, right? Uh, one is definitely heat. So even within the extruder, you have different, uh, uh, what do you say, slots in which you can have different temperature conditions, uh, so which, will, which are going to impact your how much your protein get denatured. Second is also the hydration uh, of your protein. Again, you don't want to subject your proteins, uh, which are not hydrated enough to any temperature or pressure conditions, uh, which would again lead them to lose their functionality. So answers, yeah, it just depends. Again, your pH conditions uh, in which your product is going in and that is also going to like either open up or close your protein and that is going to play an impact in how they interact with heat and denature. So di different ways to think about it. Awesome. Can, we, can you throw some insights on spray drying as a method and you know its effect on encapsulation and its use as an encapsulation technique? 
um, just general level stuff specific to uh, plant based dairy. Uh, pre drying as a technique. Uh, so, uh, pre drying as an encapsulation technique. Again, this is interesting. I have heard about it. I personally not work uh, with any encapsulation method. So, again, I would, I would ask you to you know, read through papers to kind of get a concrete answer, answer on that. But yes, spray drying has been used as an encapsulation technique by different companies. Uh, yeah, and you know, some of the research has been commercialized, some of it didn't work. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's my answer. But I would, I would just refer you to read up some papers on it. Yeah, people who have, yeah, people who are not from a scientific background or do not come with a food science background, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, just keywords, you know, um, like fat uh, or, you know, encapsulation technique, spray drying, proteins, just using those keywords results up into such brilliant articles sometimes, you'd be surprised, you know, just that's the best way of learning. Honestly, and Siddharth and I both know that we've gone through a lot of Googling to answer a lot of our questions when we were thinking about, uh, you know, our subjects back in the day of we participating in different challenges. Can algae fungi be used for the fat component in meats, plant-based meats? Yeah, actually, it's a very interesting uh, source too, right? I mean, especially algae, which are high in their uh, fat content. And, uh, you know, typically these fats have been utilized uh, to make biofuels. But then, you know, these fats can also be used in terms of uh, the, the potential to make plant-based meats. That would be great. Uh, we actually uh, have been doing extensive research on... Uh, algae as a source of making alternative protein products so please uh you know keep visiting our website we will be launching our first set of results in october and then a complete report in november uh where we'll be talking about the entire alkyl value chain and how algae can be a source uh, of ingredients and in plant-based meat products thank you thank you siddharth hmm Okay, next question is an interesting one. Uh, yeah, okay. So use of isolates or concentrates, which are high in uh, purity. Uh, there are many startups in the world which are uh, kind of also using raw whole products like jackfruit's example for functionalizing um, and getting the end product in this space. I would say, Shubham, again, a lot of the times you can look this and gauge uh, the answer for yourself uh, at the end product. Are the consumers really buying them, these products for the nutritional value of the wholesome ingredient that they're using? Or are they really buying it because it's replicating plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy? And we know for a fact that people buy on price, system, convenience. There's always going to be a niche segment you can find to sell your products to. At the end of the day, if you want to reach out to masses and really solve a problem at scale, uh, then the best approach so far, as far as we know it, is deconstructing ingredients and thinking about it. Unless you find a better way, economical way, more practical way of doing things and achieving the same end product. In that case, you've truly done a great uh, innovation, you know. So that's kind of our views on that. Um, so, so that next question is, what are the best methods for plant-based milk with respect to, again, I think this was a repeat question. Yeah, sure. So uh, spray drying and freeze drying are very expensive. Uh, any other alternate drying methods which can be explored? So I can add a little bit to this. Yeah. I know of startups in you know Nepal, Bangladesh, where uh, if we think that we don't have access to infrastructure and ecosystem in India, we are kind of uh, being privileged because there are a lot of countries in Asia, in Africa, near India, which definitely don't have even one tenth of our ecosystem and the kind of support we have in terms of ingredients, um, you know, um, co-packers, all of that. So these guys have been exploring, for example, just regular solar drying for a lot of their products, meat products that they've made from plants. So that's just one simple way, literal solar drying. And they've tweaked and built a custom uh, solar dryer and they're tweaking the parameters so that the end product is really good in terms of its sensory properties and uh, you know similar parameters for organoleptic properties. So that's just one way. There's obviously heat oven drying and number of simple uh, food processing drying processes which you can explore. But a lot of times they are not very useful for uh, volatiles and you know high. Uh, and they again, depending on the complexity of a method, nobody really invents a method unless it serves a specific purpose, right? So there are simpler methods, but then again they lead into loss of a lot of 
nutrition parameters or functionality parameters of your core ingredients. So Siddharth, any views here? No, I think I, you know, I do agree, Shatala. Like solar trying. Uh, there is drum trying too, which can be used, which could be relatively less expensive, but you, you just have to check. I mean, the, the kind of uh, output that you're going to get with spray drying, you know, it's, it's much higher than, you know, say like drum drying or solar drying, etc. And in the end, it just comes down to the volumes, right? I mean, if, if you're a company saying that I can just produce like one kg of dried isolate every day, and then there's a company which is using uh, spray drying and making like 500 kgs of dried isolate. So their cost economics is also going to be better. Uh, even though it's slightly, it might be more expensive at the beginning for the capital requirement, etc. But long term, it's going to be just faster and better. Yeah, there's one question here at the top, which you can take, Siddharth, from Pranjali. So how to retain more fat in plant-based meats and subjecting them to heat releases the fat present in the product? Does it depend on the type, form of fat used or the method used for creating the product as well as other ingredients? Which form of fat should be used ideally? So this is something what I was talking about earlier, right? Uh, so if you have a good emulsifier, so which can be protein or which can be some other ingredient, which can actually hold that fat protein water matrix together, then your fat is not going to be released. Uh, because this is a common problem found in a lot of plant-based products. Like, you know, the fat just separates out because these proteins are not as functional as animal uh, protein. So, so to answer your question, uh, how to retain more fat? Does it depend on, so does it depend on type and form of fat use? Uh, so yeah, so the fatty acid profile of animal uh, proteins are also different. So it does depend on that, but I think a major driving factor is uh, the other ingredients with fat and the texturization technologies and how they are emulsifying it well. Uh, I, th I think these, play a big role and uh, which form of fat should be ideally used. I think people use a lot of uh, coconut oil uh, for their functional properties too, but more so for their organoleptic properties because they give the same type of the fatty uh, saturated fat mouthfeel as animal products. Yeah. And again, like I know you are trying to, uh, uh, a lot of you are currently trying to answer and understand a lot of specific questions which are coming to you. So it's great. People who are putting in specific question, it means they're thinking critically about your ideas and your proposals. But uh, sometimes asking some general insight related question that would help you think better for your specific question is more useful. So at the end, you learn how to think or learn how to learn rather than, you know, Siddharth giving a spoon feed that answer for a specific dosage or specific parameter, etc. Uh, as a binder will allow, as a binder, Will low methoxyl pectin work in doing fortifications with calcium? Mm, okay, yeah, that's that's a very very specific question. Like I said, so uh, I don't know if you want to share some insights. Otherwise, we can skip and get the next question. Yeah, I guess this is also a very broad question. The last one about shelf life. Um, so I don't know. Maybe you can just throw in some general insights about shelf life in plant based meat and plant based eggs, and you know some consideration on interesting examples around how companies are overcoming that but having said that we are uh, these are these were all our questions thank you for your insightful comments and uh, questions submitted if you have any more questions we have some time so send them in now and people please support it otherwise we'll close down the webinar after a couple of these thank you yeah so when when it comes to shelf life right uh, shelf life is very important and whenever people think about shelf life you know you should think from two aspects right one is the microbial shelf life and one is the organoleptic shelf life. So even if you find that, okay, if I'm freezing my product, my product is safe for an year, uh, but then you'd see that it is still becoming like rancid or it is oxidizing or losing its like animal flavor over time. And, you know, it might be very unacceptable just three months into its shelf life from an organoleptic standpoint. So that is something to always note, always have a very robust and well-defined uh, shelf life plan included in your R&D. Uh, because trust me, like, you know, a, when a consumer has your product, you know, it should taste the same one month into the shelf life versus 11 months into the shelf life. If, if your shelf life is 11 months, otherwise, you know, your the consumers are just receiving different grades of product. And that is never good because then your brand won't be consistent, uh, which, which is not a good thing. Awesome. Um, can you take in the last question and we'll also have Varun for five minutes maybe joining the session so we can hold on people if you have any more questions now is the time please submit 
Yeah, so the, last, the question is, I've gone through the process Con is using to make the product and one of the steps is steaming the product before freezing. Can you share some knowledge that how they are preventing leakage of oil while steaming? Uh, so this is a very specific question, Tanesh. Like I, I don't know the answer to this question. Uh, I, I, I'll probably need some time to think uh, and get back to you. Awesome. And again, I think if it ties into the proposal, not. Uh, just a reminder again for everyone. Uh, I just meant definitely. I, I actually wanted all of you to think about the smart protein oath as well again. And as long as you're not communicating with the team members of the challenge for any specific questions of your proposal, we are very uh, happy to engage and see where we could help uh, your general insights get a little better in this area. But nothing related to your specific proposal or idea that you're submitting because that's part and parcel of the challenge. And we would, wouldn't want to be unfair to any other candidates. Awesome. Um, so no more questions, I'm assuming. If you do have any questions, now is the time. Please uh, do submit it so that we can answer it. We're just going to take a break for a couple of minutes and then get back for the last 10 minutes to answer any remaining questions. People who are interested, stay back. Otherwise, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, yeah, actually, I wanted to quickly show you something. Just give me a minute. Awesome. So you all have probably heard by now about the Smart Protein Summit. And the best part is being a phase two applicant, you'll get priority access to register for this. Uh, it's, it's for free. We are a nonprofit uh, and it's free for all the registrants. But we obviously have a maximum cap. So to ensure that you reserve a seat and only if you're sure that you're going to attend the days of the summit and diligently going to extract value out of the summit, I would recommend only then register. Uh, because you obviously will be taking a place from any other student or young professional who might want to be a part of this summit as well. So only then register, but I would strongly recommend each and every one of you because you've already studied so much, uh, you know, received more than 60% marks in phase one for this, uh, some, for this talent specifically. And we know with, with, with a confidence in the fact that you've gone through continuous assessment that now you know enough about the smart protein sector to engage, uh, you know, and bring your curious perspectives, your ideas, your background, wherever you're coming from, and apply it to accelerate the innovation ecosystem that we have for the sector in India. And we love saying this, once things get moving, it really leapfrogs. India has a way of leapfrogging uh, different technologies and different industries, and that's what we want to do with the Smart Protein Summit. Um, a lot of you might not know, we did uh, one of the largest gatherings in this sector for key stakeholders last year, which was the Future of Protein Summit. And now we know that the future is here. That's why this year we are rebranding it as Smart Protein Summit, you know, in line with our Smart Protein Innovation Challenge, GF Ideas India, which is the Smart Protein Innovation Community. So just open it up, explore what we are going on about. And then once you register, you'll get access to our account. And that would have a lot of facilitation for networking, for attending different sessions, uh, for saving it to your calendars, for, you know, uh, chatting with co-attendees and finding like-minded people across India in this space. So this would be very, very interesting for all of you to attend, um, you know, and this will also help people who go into phase three. We'll be declaring the results somewhere early in October, hopefully by first or second of October, once we are done evaluating your proposals in the five days after 25th of September. And then uh, we can all have a great learning experience through this. So just recommending all of you to go through it and then focus on what the mission for Smart Protein really is, how we are planning to shape this sector. Maybe these five fundamental categories in which we want to innovate also gives you some inspiration in your own ideation proposals, you know. So that's something I quickly wanted to tell all of you. And we can get back to the Q&A, assuming there might be some questions now. Awesome. I would also love to cover the poll. Uh, almost everybody has taken it now. And again, 83% people, very much in line with uh, our daily polling, have found this session to be uh, improving their proposals and ideas and they find it really useful. 80% of the content or more was useful for more than 80% of the participants. So that's really heartening to see. Uh, okay, great. So there are no questions now. So we can actually close down the webinar and, you know, catch up with you guys tomorrow in our other session with Siddharth. And then day after, obviously, we'll focus on tying some of the business aspects some key parameters there to think about after we have a couple of days of really scientific sessions. Once again, tell your teammates to join these calls and the next four webinars if they've been missing out. 
and I'll be sending the recording for this somewhere tonight. Siddharth, thank you so much again for joining us for this session today. If there are any uh, parting thoughts, uh, you can you can convey them now. No, it, it was my pleasure uh, to join uh, today's webinar. So thank you, Shardul, and thank you all the participants for uh, making uh, the innovation challenge possible and you know such a such a big success. So yeah, thank you everyone. And you know again, if you have any specific questions or anything, uh, you know do reach out to Shardul, and we'll see if we can answer them. And looking forward to see you seeing you guys tomorrow. Awesome. We also have a very, very interesting workshop coming up for people who had questions about extrusion on the 18th, which is the Friday. We are doing a very uh, insightful masterclass on uh, extrusion, specifically low moisture, high moisture, all of it, focusing on plant-based meat and plant-based seafood and you know other aspects of this smart protein sector. We'll have that masterclass with the scientists and process technologists from Wenger Manufacturing Incorporated, which is one of the largest players in this area uh, you know, thinking about uh, the sector. So please join us on 18th as well uh, to kind of add value to already wonderful perspectives that have been shared through this phase one and phase two by our many speakers. Thank you once again and have a great day ahead. Bye.